Uh, this week, I had the, uh, the joy of helping my mother-in-law get ready to move. She uh, is moving to Arizona, and, uh, and I, so I had seven hours of driving in a car this week uh, on one day. It was, it was a wonderful day of driving, and so what do you do? You tr- try to find anything to listen to, right? And so I was listening to different messages and podcasts, and I happened to find one of a leadership one from a, a speaker, John Maxwell. He's a speaker on leadership. I've, I remember reading his books 25 years ago, like just, he was a great, he's a great leader. And uh, so he was talking on this podcast about the, the, the 16 laws of communication. And so I was listening, I'm like, okay, hey, I'm getting ready to communicate to people this week. And the one that they focuses on is you have to know your audience. Who are you speaking to? So I'm thinking about that. I'm like, okay, it's Father's Day. Everyone's expecting a Father's Day message. But not everybody here is a father. Am I, is that right? I, I was pretty sure that not everyone in the audience would be a father. And, and so I, I was thinking about it. I'm like, I just, instead of giving a message, and, I, and, and really it's a lot of friends and family, right? I know a lot of you already. And, and, and so to give a message on how to be a good father, I was like, yeah, that doesn't fit. And so I want us to change it from a message from me giving a message about being a good father Let's turn the table and let's have a conversation about us being kids. How to be a kid. And, uh, and so, in and, and, and turning that around, I want us to just look at our different father. As kids, we can all look at, at a different father and, and imagine ourselves in the back seat of a long car ride and we're all having this conversation together. Now I get to start the conversation today. And hopefully it's the conversation that we can continue later. This won't be an open conversation where you get to talk back a lot during the message, although that's fun. Uh, but we'll start a conversation. And I have a picture here as uh, something I was thinking about uh, uh, getting ready to speak. And they're going to show you a picture of this is me preparing to speak to people. So I get all my crew around and you see how attentive they are. And I'm expecting that out of you to be very attentive And to be focused and all gathered around. Uh, This is actually me uh, just about ready to let them into the next pasture. And so they are all very excited. And so I'm hoping that today, uh, my message, I'll have some points that, and and hopefully you see green grass on the other side of this time. It's only a two-hour message. (laughs) We'll, We'll short, the grass gets greener the shorter it goes. So I'll get going here. Uh, so yeah, but that's just, that's just a little bit of the fun I get to do on the farm. Uh, we, do, we use animals to teach. Uh, we teach kids and teenagers about God, about life, about how to, how to walk through life and learn new things. And really, we, we take that, the idea of the family model. We want to teach by modeling, by showing them how to do it, right? Not just to speak it, but to show them. To live it out next to them. To walk through. And so we, t- I mean, everything. It, it, how to cook an egg. How to cook a steak. Tomorrow night we're cooking steaks for all of our graduates. We have three guys that are graduating high school. This last week they did. And so we're, we're cooking steaks. So they're going to get to learn how to celebrate people as they graduate. How to do everything in life. We used to joke around about uh, bringing kids to church that we would teach them everything. Even how to put on deodorant and how to brush their teeth. Now, that wasn't normally part of our Sunday lessons every week, but, but we had to teach, we want to teach every area of life, right? And so, and so we're going to talk a little bit about family, and so uh, I have three points, that's the green grass, okay? The green grass on the other side of the message that you all be attentive for, I only have three points. Uh, the first one is talking about your family gives you identity. Who your family is, when you're born into a family, they give you your identity, they give you your name. Right? Your parents give you your first name, and you get a last name. But they also pour into you. You learn everything. How you view life comes from your family. And, and this thing is, is, you don't get to choose that. You don't get to choose which family you're put in. You cannot earn a spot in a family. 18 years ago, next week, will mark the day that I held our daughter for the very first time. We went to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and it was a long journey, and it was a lot of work to get to that point, but next Sunday, we'll celebrate holding our daughter. So I have a little picture of her. 
little Eliana. She was just a tiny little peanut. Just, she was three months old the day we picked her up, the day we first held her. And uh, she was tiny, like less than seven pounds. And uh, we, her, my mother-in-law called her small but mighty. And uh, if you know Eliana, she is mighty. She is a force to be reckoned with. Uh, and here's her picture of her gra- for graduation. This is our little Eliana, and she's a joy. And, and so much fun, I mean, celebrating her this last week. Uh, she graduated from high school, on, going on to college, and just celebrating her as a person. Uh, there's a miracle that has happened with adoption. Like, and I didn't, you know, you hear about it a little bit going into it. But the moment she became ours, even I think before I held her, when we got the first picture of her, six weeks before that date, it was like, she's mine. This is my girl. There was a miracle that happened in our hearts that it wasn't, oh, this is our adopted daughter. This is our daughter from Ethiopia. No, 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 this was my daughter. And, and from there, two years later, we adopted twins. And then another couple years later, we adopted Hudson, our youngest. So we have four teenagers. I need lots of prayer today. No, but in, in every circumstance, there's a miracle that happened with adoption. They didn't, have, they didn't have any choice being a part of our family. Maybe sometimes they're like, I wish I could choose a different one. But they didn't have any choice in that matter. They can't earn their spot to be my son or daughter. They, that's who they are. They are my son and daughter. And it's interesting to me that, that God really paints that picture of adoption for us. We're not earning our way to be his kid. It says he adopts us. Paul writes about it in Romans 8.14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. Now, sonship doesn't mean it's only the guys. Sonship means family, everyone, men and women. We are adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. That Abba is like saying Daddy. It has to do with personal connection. Not a, not a, a figure far away, but like that Daddy figure that's like the kid wrapped around your leg. And you're like, Daddy, Daddy. That's the relationship that God says, I want with my kids. I adopt you in for that. Not, I'm going to tell you what to do. Dad, it's come close, curl up in my arms, sit on my lap, I'm your daddy. And we were able to cry out because he adopts us, we don't earn it, we don't get to choose it, although there is our choice, right? We do have choice in the matter. We have to choose to say, God, I want to come. I want, I, I want into your family. But he did all the work. Jesus died on the cross. He did all the work that opens that door, and we get to freely come. He chose us. Ephesians 1, 5 actually says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. He chose us. He wanted to be our father. And in him, we have identity. We become like him. He says, I want you to be part of my family. And guess what? If you're part of a family, you become a lot like your family. And, and you, your whole worldview is focused on how you grow up. That's how your worldview is. And so, uh, Amy said earlier, like, some of you, that's a hard thing. You may have hard feelings about fathers. Or about parents. I was blessed with a great home. My, my parents loved God. They loved us kids. They provided. They, they raised us in a right way. And so I have nothing but good to look at. And yet even in that, there's some little idiosyncrasies of my family that I'm like, oh, 
If I could just change this. If this, this little thing, and, and guess it's all the funny things that I used to, like as a teenager, hate. What do I do? I do those same things now. My dad's here, and, and he, uh, he and I are so much alike. We'll, we'll plan projects out separately at the farm, and then we'll get together and we'll talk about like, what things we were thinking about doing, and they're like, that's the same way I was going to do it. That was my idea too, and, and it's crazy how much we think alike. So you become really a lot like your family that you grow up in. And, and you know what? You can make changes, but you'll, it's like this slide that you'll always tend to slide back to normal. Unless you keep on working and saying, no, I want to be different. There's some things that I want to do differently. And really, that's my hope for my kids, is I want to lead them to do things right. But I also, I don't want them to be stuck at looking just at me. But there's a different father that I want them looking at. I want their adoption to be adoption to God the Father and to start acting like him. Because I'm going to be a failed representation of that, right? I'm, I am not perfect. Some of you are surprised. No, I'm not. My kids aren't that I say that. Thank you, Kyle. <laughs> he knows me too well. And, that, and that's the conversation piece, right? If we're familiar and we're just talking, we all know. There's things that we know we need to change. And that's our behaviors. Our behaviors need to match up with our family. We get our identity from our family, but then our behaviors follow that. Right? And that's the, the, the second point that I want to make. So here's our green grass moving on to the second point. That phrase, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. We become a lot like our families. Our, our behavior matches that. And if our behavior is not what we want it to be, the next step is looking back at, okay, who, who is my family that I'm learning from? What's my family? And Jesus says a couple things interesting. Um, Matthew 5, 9, he says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So here is an example of Jesus is saying, your actions show what family you're a part of. Right? Now that's a good one. Like, hey, I'll be a peacemaker. That's good. I want to be a peacemaker. Then I'm called a son of God. That's good. Now Jesus also calls out a different group in John 8. He calls out a group that is kind of fighting against him. That's actually trying to put Jesus to death. And he said to them... You're like your father, the devil. Your, their actions were showing who their father was. So our actions can show who our father is. And I think we can get on this merry-go-round of my, is my identity what causes my actions? My actions show my identity. The circle. What comes first, right? My actions are first or my identity first? My actions show my identity. My identity shows my actions. And it's kind of like you get on this merry-go-round. And, and, you know, in Christian circles, we talk a lot about faith and works. What comes first? I have faith in God, right? My salvation is free. It's, I didn't do anything to earn it. And yet God says, now follow your faith up with actions. It's that circle of what... It's not just one or the other. It's they're tied together. There's this circle of my identity is connected to my actions. My actions shows back to my identity. And so I want us to get on this kind of merry-go-round of thinking. And thinking about how I change my actions and how I change my identity. Now, we have a, uh, a couple cows. We have a couple calves that we raised last year. And uh, every day I would have to go out and feed the calves' milk. Um, and so I would bring out two buckets of milk, and I'd give one to one. His name was Gus. I'd give the other one to Sean, and they would drink their milk. And he had to do that at the beginning four times a day. Then it got less each, each week or every couple weeks. So it kind of go down. And uh, Sean decided it would be a good idea to break the holder of milk. He would just play with the bucket and rip it around, and all of a sudden it was broken. 
And uh, so then I had to start doing, give Gus his milk in the holder. Then I would have to stand and hold the bucket for Sean. Every day, a couple times a day, I'm sitting there holding his bucket. And while I'm holding the bucket, what am I doing? I talk to him. I touch him. I pet him. He gets to know me. He's familiar with me. He knows I'm the one that brings milk. Now, they both are pretty easygoing, right? Fast forward a couple months, and I, we're going to start putting a halter on them and teaching them how to be led. Because we want kids to be able to lead all of our animals so that they're safe and they're, they listen. And so we're training them. And even just getting the halter on, Sean, no problem. Easy as could be. He's, he wants to stand right next to you. He wants to nuzzle up to you. You just put the halter on and, he, and he's ready to go. The, now, getting him to follow you, it was a little bit of work. Right? He was like, ah, no, you're, play, you're pulling my face. I don't want to do that. And so it was a little bit of work. We had to have guys next to him, but eventually he got it. Gus, on the other hand, he was not having it. He's like, no, I am not going where you want me to go. And, and at one point we had like, Three kids in the back trying to push him forward. A couple kids in the front trying to pull him forward. And Gus is like, no, I don't even want this thing on my head. I'm going to run away. And so you fast forward six months, and there's still, you can still see it a little bit. Sean walks right up to you. You can touch him. I have a picture of Calvin and, and Sean, and he's super friendly. Gus, he'll, he'll kind of sit back. He's like, nah, I'm good. Even this week, I was getting him to take him to a new pasture, and he was like, you're not putting that thing on me. I, I'm really not interested. It took a lot of work to get him, put the halter on, and lead him to the next pasture. And, uh, but that's the time to train them, right? When they're 100 pounds. I've got a couple that are 600 pounds. They're different animals to train. They tell you a little bit more where you want to go. But yet, uh, two days ago, I led those 600-pound bulls to new pasture and they walked right with me no problem because we started off when they were young they got to know me they got to know people to trust people and so their behavior followed does that make sense and that's really how a picture of what it is with god when we have time with him our behavior changes we become like him. We start learning. What is he like? I'm going to become like that. And, and really our actions follow that. So I encourage you if you, have, if you look at yourself and go, my actions aren't lining up, then I would say, go spend some time with your father. Because time with him creates different behaviors. And just to kind of understand what is God like? How does God treat us? He treats us with a lot of love and compassion, right? How he meets us. We have a picture of that in, in Luke and in Matthew. They talk about the, the, the parable of the lost sheep. And Jesus is sharing, what is God like when he goes after sheep that are far away and lost? He searches for them. He doesn't just uh, let the coyotes have them. They're f whatever. They're never going to listen. No, he searches after when he gets there, he picks them up. I always joke with kids. Does it say that he drop kicks them because he's mad at them for running away and being lost and causing trouble and eating the flowers? No. They're in trouble still for eating the flowers. But uh, no, the, the picture is he picks them up. He sees where they're at. He sees exactly where, how far away they are, picks them up, and brings them back. And not only brings them back, he celebrates that they're back. That's how our father does business. Now if you become part of his family, guess what? He's going to be asked you to be part of the family business. Right? In history, people grew up and they learned their job from their family. Most families, most people would do exactly the family business. Just because they learned up, they helped the family business. And now we've kind of changed that where now you can go out and, and get a career. You go to school and you go out and find out your own career. But how many times does you end up doing something very similar to the family business, to what your parents did? Because 
That was familiar. You knew that. You, you understood what it was. We become a lot like, and God invites us to be part of his business, which is finding lost people. He has a heart for lost people. He has a heart for hurting people. Right? He took his time away to, to go reach people that everyone else had pushed away. That's the heart of God. That's how he acts. And so he's going to ask his kids, hey, do what I do. Love like I love. Talk to people like I would talk to people. And if you're like, well, I don't know, like, I'm, these people are really bad. These people are really evil. What they're doing, I need to come against them and really be harsh. And I would just say, is that what your father does? Is that what your adopted father does? Does he go after people when they're hurting, when they're far away, and be rude and mean to them? Or does he reach out to them, find them, bring them back to safety, and love them? Right? That's who our father is. And, and that's where we get, get on this cycle of, I'm going to go spend time with him to learn the family business, how we do business, so that I can treat others the same way. This, this summer, you guys are doing the Wednesday night. The church is doing the Wednesday night outreaches here. Uh, reaching a community. A community that, you know, I've, I've done outreaches in this community. We used to bus kids from this community to the farm and to church. And uh, I, there's families that are going through hard stuff. And they don't need somebody to say how bad they are or that was a wrong choice. Man, how could you make that choice? No. They need people to say, hey, you're, you're welcome here. We, we want to adopt you into our family. We want to make you family. And you might have neighbors and friends and coworkers that, you know what? They, need, they don't need someone to preach at them. They need someone to, to adopt them into family and say, come on close. You're welcome here. You don't have to earn your spot. I can show you love unconditionally. Right? I can be a listener. I can, I can provide for you. And our goal is always that, not that they would be best friends with us, but what is the goal? That they would be adopted into a different family. Right? They would become brothers and sisters, just like we are brothers and sisters, right? In faith, we're all sons and daughters of God, adopted in. And that's what we want for our world. That's really the heartbeat of everything we do at Treetop Farm, is we want to take kids that don't know anything about God, and we want to just start showing them, what does it look like to be a follower of God? How do followers of God deal with family? How do we deal with every part of life? How do we work? How do we celebrate people? How do we do everything? They're going to see that by being part of our family. We invite kids in to be part of family. And really, that's the heartbeat of a church, is to reach out to a community and say, community, you're our family. Come close. And, and really, it's about the church, us, working on our own identity. Okay, God, you're my father. I want to be close to you. Spending two minutes a day, right? Two minutes. That consistency, drawing close to God. All right, I want to, this is how we do it. This is how God treats people. This is what God says about loving others. I want to do it the way he does it. Let my behavior match that, right? Treating others how God treats us. And that's how we live. We live on this merry-go-round of loving people, loving God. Loving people, loving God. And it's a good thing. And what's cool is there's a reward coming, an inheritance. The scripture that I read talks about that inheritance. Heaven is coming. This family here is grieving. But there's an inheritance that he gained as a son. A promise. God's promise. This life is short. <laughs> 22 years ago, my dad preached a message about death. That day, they were hit by an oncoming car. And they almost died that day. But his message was, this life, it's just a shell. 
there's eternity on the other side. And when you're a son or a daughter of the king, the inheritance is that. There's heaven promised. No more of this. We become just perfection in heaven. We are in his family. We are the perfect reflection of him. And so as we mourn, yep, we do. It's a loss. But there's that, that hope that we have. And, and as I was, was worshiping today and I was just thinking about your family, I thought, Jesus always took time. Out of, he would go out of the way to care about people that were, he didn't know, that weren't necessarily the good or anything. He, he saw people hurting, he would go. And he would be close. And I believe that God is close. God is close to those that are mourning and hurting. And he wants us to be the same way. As a church, he wants you to be close to those in our community that need him. To live a life that says, I'm going to keep on reaching out and loving because that's what my father does. And I'm going to be part of the family business. Amen? Church, two minutes a day changes everything. Right? Loving people, adopting those around you, loving them consistently. Consistently. You don't have to get down on people. You don't have to yell and scream. that You're doing, this is going horrible. Nope. We can stand firm and know truth and speak truth. But how do we do it? How does our Father do that? He loves people. So that's why I encourage you to do that. As kids, let's act like our Father. Let's act like our Father. Let's pray for a moment, and then I'm going to ask Todd to come up and pray for all of our fathers. So God, you are close. You are our Father. You have adopted us in, not by anything that we earned but we get to come and call you daddy. We get to call you daddy. And you let us run and play. And you also hold us close when we're hurting. But God, everything we do, we want to be followers of you. We want to imitate you. We want to learn the family business of how to treat others. How to live life. So God, we want to come close to you. Today we come close. We take this moment just to pause and say, God, teach me your ways. Let me be a part of your family. Now just pause and say, if you are, you say, you say I would never have been part of God's family. I've, I've never made that decision let me just say the door is open. That I, I grew up in a Christian family and I heard the message a thousand times. And in college, something clicked in my heart. I don't deserve heaven. God really opened up my heart and let me see how bad, how far away I was from him. And it got my attention. I don't deserve heaven. I've done wrong things. I have broken all of God's rules. And he says, yep, and my son came to pay to buy your adoption fees. He came to pay for everything. All the things that I deserve punishment for, he says, I take. I will pay for them on the cross. So if you're here today and you're saying, I'm not a part of that family yet, God's saying the door is open. Now, all of your past mistakes, the wrong things that you've done, God is saying, my son will pay for you. I want to be your father. I want you to come and follow me and be a part of my family. And that's just saying, God, I need you. In your own words, you can say, God, I'm sorry for what I did. 
God, I've lived away from you. I have been a rebellious kid. That sheep that ran really far away, that's me. Jesus, you paid the price for all of my mistakes. I need you to pay for me. I come and grab onto you and say, Daddy, I want to be a part of your family. And God wants you in his family. Amen. You know, Pastor Bob had asked me if I would pray for the fathers today. Um, but as we sit here, my mind goes blank because of Steve and his family. And, and uh, I just want to share with the family how loved he was and is. Because the scriptures tell us that we mourn with those who mourn. And when I look behind you, I know you can't see it, but this church is mourning with you. They loved your son and your brother. And so I just want you to know that, that he was dearly loved, first by God, but by this body of Christ. They loved your brother and your son. So next, I'd like to pray for all your fathers and dads. So if you'd bow your heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you loved us first, that you called us to be dads, to be husbands, to be fathers, to serve you, to lead, to guide, to follow truth, to follow you, to lay down our lives for our children, for our wives. Father, you laid our, your life down first for us, so we are grateful, we are indebted, as Pastor Tony shared, we are adopted. We are now sons, and I pray for every man in this room that is a father, that wants to be a father, Lord. We ask for your blessing over them. We ask for your leadership over them. We ask that you'd guide them, instruct them in the ways that they should go, and train up their children. So we praise you for this. We thank you for this, and we just are grateful for your love. In Jesus' name, amen.